You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more information about the variety of topics covered on this show, as well as my other podcast, How to Stan, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. And if you enjoy this episode, please consider becoming a monthly donor to support my work and allow it to continue to go on and be free for all to access for as low as 99 cents a month. Visit the Support the Show link on my site's homepage for more information. Hello everybody and welcome back to 17 Kara K-Pop. Today's BT Study Guides episode, quick heads up, will address some really dark topics, including death and suicide. So please be aware of that, but I will also try to not get too specific and tread very carefully when I address those heavy topics. Here is my overview of Flatter Than Bombs and how this movie came to inspire some of BTS's work. Before I get to the characters and plot, just a few fun facts and general context. Flatter Than Bombs was originally a movie idea that got scrapped due to a lack of funds, but last minute a French and German TV network saved the movie. Flatter Than Bombs is directed and written by Joachim Trier. This is actually his first English movie, and he's probably most well known for directing the movie Reprise from 2006, which we can address more later. The main characters include Isabel Reed, who is the mom who died in the story. The kids were told it was a car crash, and that's a big part of the story is the revelation when they learn what actually happened. So Isabel is the mom who died. She appears throughout the movies just in dreams and flashbacks, and they remember her for being a war and conflict photographer. So the main plot centers around preparing a photo exhibit of his mom's photography. Isabel's widow is Jean, who actually gave up his dreams of becoming an actor so his sons could have a stable and quote-unquote regular life. So he became a high school teacher instead. What makes this deed a bit less noble, I guess, is how Jean uses his high school teaching opportunity to follow his son Conrad, who goes to that school, and he keeps spying on him. For good reason, I guess he's worried about him, but it's not the most ethically sound thing to do, I guess, anyway. So then what ends up happening is that Jean wants to check on Conrad to make sure he's coping okay with the loss of his mom, But by following him around, Conrad catches on to that and ends up acting differently because he knows he's being watched. So in other words, instead of helping, it's actually hurting the situation. His dad's making sure he's honestly doing good, but he has to put up a dishonest front in the process. Gene even goes so far as to follow his son around in the virtual world through a video game avatar. It's a lot of ways of trying to connect with him and reach out to him make sure everything's all good, without just doing it overtly. Conrad is his son. He was only 12 when his mom passed and is now age 15. Jonah is Conrad's older brother. He is a college professor who is depressed and continuously grieving his mother. He actually knows what Conrad doesn't. He knows that his mother did not die in a car crash. He knows what really happened, but He also has a hard time believing it. So it's an interesting juxtaposition because Conrad has no idea, but even Jonah, who does have an idea, refuses to hold that idea in his head. He is married with a newborn child he named after his mom, Isabel. And what really makes that relationship complicated is Aaron, his wife, he met during a chance encounter in a hospital. He claimed his wife was dying of cancer just like her spouse was and he bonded with her initially over a lie. So the story is about Isabel, a photographer, her husband, Jean, who is a high school teacher, his sons, Conrad and Jonah. Jonah is now married with a newborn, and he married Aaron. And lastly, Richard, who is the person who revealed in this New York Times piece that he's the one who had an affair with Isabel. So like I said before, Jonah is married with a kid now, so he does not live with the family anymore. But he does for this story because he is coming back for an extended visit to help Jean and Conrad put together this art exhibit. It's going to be a big 
collection, a big retrospective on the life and work of Isabel on display at his museum. Jonah actually didn't want to work on this curation, but he felt like he had to. He knows his mom more than anyone and wants to make sure he does justice by her through this collection. Plus, he has a feeling that this is when Conrad will have to find out why his mother actually died, and he wants to be there for that. Conrad has been acting very odd and strange, and Jonah then gets to see Conrad's diary entries, which explain a lot. Jonah advises him, though, against what he wants to do, which is share the diary with his friend, Melanie. Against Jonah's wishes, though, Conrad shares those diary entries with her anyway. The big bombshell moment, no pun intended, is when Richard, that New York Times reporter, tells Jean, Isabel's widow, that he had been in that overseas affair with Isabel as she was photographing the war. Yeah, there's a lot of emotional baggage to unpack there. Conrad finds out when he hears talk about this affair being publicly disclosed, as well as hearing talk about how Jonah is not doing well mentally right now. Conrad actually is presumably unaware that Jonah already knew all this. So it's like he thinks they are having a shared struggle over this fresh realization, and he doesn't realize he's actually the last to know in their family. So there are a lot of heavy emotions here. Grief, betrayal, a sense of being misunderstood, loneliness, checking in on people and maybe not sure how to do that, how to help people, how to comfort people, lots of intense emotion. So what does this story have to do with BTS? There are a lot of broad themes that are parallels, as well as more specific symbols. The car crash that is alluded to in BTS videos is similar to the facade put on by these people about Isabel's death. BTS also has used cracked mirror imagery for promo posters, as is the display of the movie poster for Louder Than Bombs. BTS members in their videos seem to have photos and cameras, Polaroids, etc. be a big constant visual presence, which makes sense why they would incorporate an influence of a story about a photographer. There's that interaction between Jonah and Aaron in the hospital that made me think of Jungkook in the hospital during the Love Yourself era videos, having that chance encounter broadly this story touches on themes that BTS does as well. Youth, feeling like an outcast, grief, depression, bursts of positive feelings that seem ironic to have, but you gotta learn to accept that you have those happy moments too, and that it doesn't invalidate your grief as well that can coexist. Those bursts of joy like having a crush. Lots of flashbacks. That's how Isabel is represented in the story in the movie. She is showing up in dreams and flashbacks, and those play a big role in BTS's storytelling as well. Different ways to cope, some healthy, some not, more often not. Drastically different recollections of the same event, the same point in time. And to me, the biggest parallel I see, the reason why they, I think, have been influenced by this movie and this story, is that it is a narrative that is really driven by visuals. Not just because Isabel is a photographer character, but that's how the actual cinematography plays out. Dialogue is not the standout of this movie. It's really a lot of heavy silences. A lot of really heavy pauses for the viewer to stop and reflect on all of the layered and confusing and intense emotions represented by these characters. It really forces viewers to sit with some very dark stuff and deep thoughts about love and how you remember your loved ones or want to remember them. How much you can accept the truth about how they were no angel in their time on earth. How do you cope with the sense that you were lied to? Did the lie do more damage over time? than it would have to tell you the ugly truth eventually. And those deep questions and moments where viewers can really stop and force themselves to put themselves in those shoes and try to think about how they would feel and react in those situations, that self-reflection is provoked through BTS's work as well. Their narrative has to be, naturally, 
driven by the visual component because that's the nature of music videos. I constantly think about the BTS lyric, we will continue to listen to your story so speak yourself. And that concept of speaking yourself, finding a way to speak your truth, is what motivates BTS to make the work they do. It's kind of a prompting, a template, for listeners and viewers to use to figure out who they are. So they provoke introspection just as this movie does and encourages people to speak themselves in whatever medium works for them. Interestingly, they not only do that for the viewers in Louder Than Bombs, but they also then do it for the characters themselves. They show that you can speak yourself in different languages, languages of photography or other types of art, not just literal language the way we think of it. There are some lyrics in the song Louder Than Bombs by BTS that really remind me of this movie. Most strongly the lyric, the pain I have is called hypocrisy. That could apply in so many ways to this movie. The pain you have towards what is hypocritical. There are many ways I could specifically interpret that, but I really want to just leave my listeners to interpret that for themselves as well. Other quotes worth sitting with include, No matter what night swallows me, I won't give up. A fight for you will shine, you and I feel together. The times I ignored you, the days where I kept running, there won't be any more. A strange shadow in that cheer, your silent sorrow shake me in my quiet sea. Waves rise, louder than bombs I break which seems to allude to if you hide your true feelings for too long, they will burst out of you at some point. The truth will come out. Your feelings will have to come out. There are some interesting possible nods to other BTS songs as well in this one. Like when they sing in this song, Where's My Way? J-Hope and Ego then sings that way, which I thought was an interesting possible connection. And when in this song they say, Let's see and hear only good things no more. It seems to refer back to the song 2-3 where RM says, let's only see good things. But then eventually he says, I can't lie like that. And lastly, in this song they sing, make a promise for you and I. It's one of the last lyrics. And leaving it on that note feels reminiscent of Jimin's solo song, Promise, when he wanted to release a song encapsulating his feelings about making a promise to the fans to be more open with us, be more honest about how he's really doing, all of that stuff. So it's a very, very vulnerable song and movie. Another example of the many sources of inspiration for them that make perfect sense and summarize what the universal appeal of BTS's work truly is and how they tap into universally relatable human emotions with their work. If you want more commentary about this movie just some thoughts to sit with that were provoked while I was thinking about this story. I have five big, super open-ended questions for you to sit with. They also tie into BTS's work as well. Theme one is life feeling interrupted. The movie is jolting at points because not only is there not a chronological order because of the flashbacks and dreams and everything, but also because there's a moment when the narrator reminds viewers that one of those characters will remember that specific moment in the movie for years to come. So the movie narrative commands your attention. You can't be lulled into this passive viewing for very long. And the same goes for BTS's characters in their music video universe. What comes to mind is when Yoongi sat up abruptly on that couch when his phone buzzed, he was just chilling and then he says something about why these messages from people always usher in sudden fear of what you're gonna read. Theme one, life interrupted. Theme two, escape. And what does it really mean to escape? Escape what? Jonah keeps essentially escaping this falsified vision of a perfect life he's living with a wife and kids the classic storybook life, that's part of the reason he decided to do this art curation project because that's both the opposite of an escape for him and his intense negative feelings, and it's a total escape from his wife and kid. And that is quite the, quite the realization. And I bring up the term escapism a lot on this show because music videos are an escape. But escape from what? That's just something I've been thinking about lately. And if you're escaping all the time, 
does the term escape even apply anymore? If it's just your go-to move, it's your normal thing to do, can you still technically define it as an escape? If you spend more time immersed in different realities, does your real reality become the escape? Is that how Jonah's thinking about it? Third set of questions this movie provokes is about how much of our lives is merely acting? How different are we in public versus private? Would we be radically different people? If we were never conscious of who is looking at us, would we be the same in private and public then? Or would we keep following prescribed notions of how to behave, what is acceptable behavior, feeling like we are being watched? And by putting on the act, are we just conforming to norms in society as normal, or is it actually a troubling thing? Does it draw a clear line between who you really are and who you're not? The teachings of Irving Goffman that I have gone on about at length on previous BT Study Guides episodes, or at least other psychology mixed with sociology commentary filled episodes, has a lot to do with that concept of life as a theater performance and how much we are pretending all day long. Theme four, revisiting and revising history. Jonah tries to censor and destroy any evidence of his mom's affair. He refuses to fully let himself accept the facts of her life as they were. He wants to continue to view her as this perfect, perfect, perfect person. And maybe that's the wrong way to look at loving someone or something. It doesn't necessarily have to be if you dislike this major thing about them, if you're ashamed about this major thing about them, if something in their past brings you pain and anger towards them. That doesn't automatically erase some of the good you see in them. It doesn't have to be a zero-sum view of them. Just because you see a flaw in them doesn't mean that automatically it cancels out a good thing in them. But that is how a lot of people try to remember people after they've left them. Lastly, honesty as a foundation for relationships. How essential is it? Because remember, Jonah's marriage is premised on a lie that bonded them. And then of course there's all the secrecy and lying surrounding Isabel's life and relationship. But maybe honesty really was the right foundation for a relationship. And it's lacking here because by shielding his younger son from the truth, Gene missed a potentially huge opportunity to bond with him, to grieve with him, to help him process the grief and the fact that he's going to have to admit to himself his mom brought him some pain over what she did. And then you would have to learn to understand how that does not mean he has to diminish his love of her. He can love her flaws and all. It doesn't taint her image or who she was to show all facets of her humanity. But he can't really sit with that thought if no one is telling him the truth. So the sugar coating is just in the long run, not helping him developmentally grow. So this surveillance role Gene takes, this concern from afar approach maybe won't cut it and the full truth eventually does come out. At an awkward time, the newspaper report exposing the affair actually was published before they all thought it would be. So life will throw those schedule warping moments at you and how do you prepare to handle them if you've been blindsided until that happens? Just some final thoughts to consider. That's all for me today. Stay tuned, lots more BT Study Guides content. I know I said it's a seven part series, but that's because seven's a special number. So I wanna keep it technically seven, but there are a few what we'll call bonus episodes as well coming. So lots more literature and BTS parallels to talk about. So stay tuned. Please rate and review the show where you listen. Thank you all for your support and I will talk to you all again very, very soon.